Welcome, everyone. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for arriving here on this very sunny day. So we appreciate you being here. Um, uh, welcome to the Nudu Talks on Experiential Futures. Um, also, welcome to the online audience uh, online. Nice to have you there as well. Um, if online you at any point can't hear us properly or you have any other technical issues, please do write on the chat and we will try to solve the problems. Um, so we're here at the Nodus Talks. Uh, this is organized by Nodus, uh, this Sustainable Design Research Group uh, at Aalto University. My name is Satu Avanranta. I'm the coordinator of the Nodus Talks. Um, and Nodus Talks are, have been organized already for almost nine years, uh, about four times a year. Um, and the idea is to build a bridge between practice and uh, research. So the concept has uh, this, that we always have one researcher and one practitioner. Um, today, I have a pleasure to introduce uh, Idil Gazioulusoy and Anu Seister, who are going to be talking. So first, we're going to have a discussion. Uh, first, we're going to have a talk, a presentation by them. So uh, each has um, a slot. Uh, and then after that, we will have uh, a panel discussion. So we don't have we don't take uh, questions in between the presentations or during the presentations. But we hope that you uh, make a note, at least a mental note of all your questions. So we have a, a lively conversation uh, after the presentations. Um, so today we're talking about uh, experiential futures. Um, first of, uh, is going to be talking a researcher. So we have Idil Gazioulusoy. Uh, she's a sustainability scientist and design researcher, and also a professor of uh, uh, sustainable design at Aalto. And she's the leader of Nodus Research Group. Um, in her talk, she will introduce experiential futures as a potential approach for democratizing, imagining and discussing sustainable futures. After her speak uh, talk, we're going to um, uh, have Adu Seisto. Uh, she leads the future customer team at VTT, uh, combining foresight and human-centric approaches. And in her uh, talk, she will give an example from a study on the future of food, of how experiencing possible futures can make it easier for people from different backgrounds to discuss and share ideas and opinions. So enjoy the talk and we will have a lively discussion after the presentations. Thank you, Satu. Um, thank you everyone for coming. So, Maybe I will start by saying that I'm very excited to be doing this uh, together with Anu, who is also a researcher. We're kind of both practitioner researchers. Our research is very real life um, centered. And I am hoping that I'm going to set a scene, also a little bit of an, like the academic background or for why experiential futures and what is experiential futures in the context of sustainable trans transitions, transformations. Uh, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Anu, uh, um, who I believe is going to be telling us much more interesting and exciting stuff than I will. Um, so also I'm a little bit unwell today. I'm really sorry. I'm not at my best presentable self, um, but hopefully the material I'm going to share with you is going to compensate for my bad voice and um and yes i'm just going to switch my um switch to my slides okay um so as Sato said uh, i'm professor of sustainable design i'm a i'm both a sustainability scientist and a design researcher so um i my research is at the intersection of of sustainable uh, sustainability science, sustainable transformations, transitions, and design research. And I use a lot of uh, futures 
theories and uh, practical tools in my work. So I am very sure everyone in the in the room and also in the virtual room are very familiar with uh, what you are seeing here, just to set the scene. Um, so uh, we know that uh, we are faring really badly when it comes to planetary boundaries uh, and updated um, updated um, version of this it was published towards the end of last year. Uh, so now we know that we have overshot uh, six out of nine boundaries. And this is not the full picture because there is a whole social dimension. And we also know that we're not meeting the social foundations of sustainability. So when we talk about sustainability uh, these days, we're actually talking about three interrelated concepts, sustainability, resilience, and justice. I'm not going to get into the detail uh, of these. Uh, so sustainability is reducing impact. Um, resilience is adapting to already locked in uh, impact and also the impact that we are constantly creating uh, by way of not necessarily addressing the issues. So there's a lot of locked in uh, climate change uh, but also uh, locked in impacts of uh, all of the other environmental issues um, that are going to that are already affecting us, but also they're going to you know continuously uh, increasingly influence our lives. So resilience is very important, adaptation is very important, but also um, hypothetically, we can have a multiplicity of sustainable and resilient futures, but not all of them are just futures. So in the past uh, past five years, the concept of justice in transitions and transformations have become very important. So while we are moving towards, um, towards sustainable and resilient futures, how do we also ensure inter and intergenerational justice and also increasingly more interspecies uh, justice? So this is a huge, huge task. Um, which we refer to as transitions or transformations. Uh, so transitions or transformations are structural, long-term and radical systemic changes. Um, hello, welcome. Would you mind sharing it on Zoom because now they might see the slides? How come they cannot see it? <laughs> Maybe there is someone who cannot see. Can you see it? I can't actually see that. Sorry about that. I'll see why. I can't. Okay. Okay. Maybe we ask the others if they can see it or not. Um, so transitions uh, or transformations are highly complex and dynamic processes. They're long-term processes. They kind of unfold over multiple decades. They have very large stakeholder base. Obviously, the whole society. Um, and if we also start to count uh, myriad species and more than human entities, uh, the stakeholder base even is larger. Um, and uh, these processes replace institutions, they challenge power structures, they challenge vested interests, uh, and they're underlined by high uncertainty. So one very uh, kind of commonly used tool or approach uh, to kind of um, govern uh, transition processes are transition arenas. Has anyone heard of the concept of transition arena in here? Okay, great. So some of you have. For those who have not, transition arenas are, uh, are, hi, are um, spaces for pioneers, front runners to develop shared visions, and then start experimentation uh, and also, of course, develop process uh, policies. Um, so the transition arenas have been running in multiple uh, topics, started with energy um, many decades ago. Uh, but now we have, and also this has started in the Netherlands, but now we have multiple transition arenas in Finland. So uh, there are a multiplicity of transition arenas, either about urban transformation or about provisional systems, such as, yes, energy, but also mobility and biodiversity and food and whatnot. Um, so 
while these processes are involving stakeholders, uh, the stakeholders are generally uh, limited to um, businesses who are incumbent and businesses that are uh, a kind of niche innovators, of course, policymakers, but there's this kind of non-transparency when it comes to uh, citizens and people and everyone who is going to be affected uh, for a long time from the decisions that are being made, the experimentations that are being made in these transition arenas. So they're essentially expert-led processes. And I'm gonna show you two theoretical models. Um, this is from, uh, uh, from 2000, early 2000s. And this shows the multi-phase model of uh, transitions or system innovations. So it's, many of you will recognize this. It looks like a, the um, S curve of innovation. Well, essentially um, transitions are system innovations. So no surprise that there is an S curve. Uh, but if, if we look at um, the kind of, the start is pre-development and then these processes take off, then there's a point where there's going to be a breakthrough, hoped, and then we reach a stabilization, so a new normal. So um, in pre-development and also maybe takeoff phases uh, of these processes, it makes a lot of sense that these processes engage first and foremost front runners. Uh, but as these processes mature, there is a need for involving uh, you know, a broader uh, base of stakeholders. This is another and newer theoretical model, which is known as the X-curve <laughs> of um, transitions. So S-curves and X-curves and whatnot. But here we also see a kind of similar uh, idea here. Uh, this is a bit more sophisticated model, um, but um, essentially, there's this kind of buildup of these processes, um, and then uh, and then there's a breakdown of old systems and institutionalization of new systems. So for some transitions, particularly energy, for example, we are at this um, chaotic chaotic center where there's kind of a lot of vested interests fighting with one another. Um, you know, we're trying to institutionalize uh, new socio-technical systems, renewable energy, et cetera. Um, but there's also, for example, in my research group, we have one postdoc who is studying energy justice. Uh, there's a lot of uh, other stakeholders than businesses and policymakers who are, you know, who have really big stakes in what is happening in these transitions. So, um, as a design researcher, I am a very, initially very human-centered, increasingly more and more than human-centered. Um, and in democracies, uh, if we want major change and if we want it to happen fast, fast enough, we really need to involve uh, citizens uh, and empower them uh, in order to imagine these futures and also enact on these futures. But how do we do that? So a few years ago, um, one postdoc uh, researcher of mine, Claudia, Claudia Gardonio, who is uh, now actually an assistant professor in Mexico, uh, we studied um, we studied um, what is known as experiential futures, uh, because I have this idea or hypothesis that experiential futures can actually assist us involving citizens more effectively uh, into the processes of transition arenas. Um, this was a multifaceted uh, study. We looked at the kind of history of design. We looked at the history of futures. And also uh, there is a connection between neuroscience and imagination. So we lo also looked at that um, and, uh, and then uh, we have kind of, where's this experiential futures is here. So experiential futures has close connections with certain design approaches. First and foremost, of course, experience design. Um, and why ex experiential futures 
uh, can actually have a potential is also uh, the knowledge comes from neuroscience that imagining alternative futures is actually very, very difficult for a lot of people. It's really difficult. And this is a neuroscientific fact. You know, just you can't imagine. I'm, I mean, not everyone can imagine, uh, uh, you know, 40 years ahead or 25 years ahead, what alternative futures can there be? Um, it turns out that if you actually are a sci-fi reader, you are better uh, in uh, being able to imagine because your anticipatory capacities are higher. But also those people are attracted to reading sci-fi, maybe, because they have those capacities in place. So they are trying to satisfy uh, their imagination hunger. But anyway, um, so... Um, Moving to the why of experiential futures, I would like to first state that um, a lot of design scholars and practitioners confuse experiential futures with speculative design. Uh, speculative design um, is not experiential futures, although they, you know, there, there are certain relationships because in speculative design, there is also an element of you know, imagining uh, speculative futures. But experiential futures is um, is much more strongly embedded and grounded in foresight and foresight methods. I'm gonna to come to that maybe a little bit later, but why experiential futures? So we talked about this experiential gulf. It's very difficult for an ordinary person to imagine alternative futures. Um, so uh, the kind of proponents of experiential futures is, um, or the, maybe the first person who coined the term is Stuart Candy, uh, although before him, uh, for example, Wendy Schultz uh, was talking about similar concepts without necessarily using the experiential as a term. Um, but experiential futures is uh, about creating real memories of imaginary situations. So it is about putting people um, in situations where they can actually experience the foresighted future. Um, and moving on. So um, this is a kind of very, very generic how of experiential futures. This comes from Candy again. And um, so you start with a setting and then you develop a scenario or multiple scenarios. And that's essentially what happens in foresight. Foresight is about scenario development. But then experiential future st starts with creating a situation. Uh, and these situations are sometimes one-to-one -one scales of visitable installations. Um, sometimes they are also videos. Um, while videos are probably not as experiential, but still they have, you know, they create a lot of kind of um, emotive response and trigger imagination because they're visual. And then within this situation, you create stuff. So, you know, artifacts from the future. There are, uh, there's a, a lot more stuff on uh, Stuart Candy's, for example, whip, uh, uh, blog. Um, if you are interested to learn more, you can uh, you can definitely go and check his work. But a couple of things, first of all, for experiential futures uh, to successfully um, be a tool for uh, transition arenas, um, we need to find ways of creating these situations and stuff. Uh, that are a little bit more um, more layered and complex than maybe traditional experiential futures exhibitions and um, artifacts from the future are. And uh, again, behind these situations and stuff, there is hard foresight work. So that's why experiential futures is different than speculative design, because in speculative design, we're not necessarily uh, very kind of interested in uh, creating foresight scenarios, 
but more about speculative, you know, ideas about speculative futures to have conversations. But experiential futures is grounded in hard foresight. So it's really important that there are these scenarios. Um, and then uh, when also preparing these material, uh, Candy and Dunnigan talk about uh, the rule of thumb of 550 and five, meaning some people have time and interest that is equal to 500 units of time, some people only 50 units of time, and some people only five units of time. And you need to create or you need to cater for all of these audience types. Arguably, the 500 units of time is the scenario. People who you know, are very interested in the nits and grits of these foresighted scenarios can actually read the reports and scenarios. But then you create, um, you create uh, you know, situations and stuff that can grab attention for 50 units of time and five units of time. So the, the question when, when you're designing an experiential futures installation is then, okay, what is an artifact that you know, I can put here in this situation that is going to um, give the experience of the imagined future to a person who doesn't have a lot of time or attention span but in that kind of five units of time, they grasp something fundamental about that future. So this is a hy hypothesis um, that has been kind of exciting me for quite a while. Can we actually use experiential futures for democratizing transition arenas or democratizing these uh, you know, transitions, transformations processes? And then came, I mean, I'm I'm doing this kind of work with students quite a lot, but maybe uh, this uh, this is uh, um, the very first very interesting uh, project that I had the kind of opportunity and chance to be involved in. Um, so this is my last slide because I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna leave the stage to Anu to talk about in much more detail. So then. Um, Anu approached me because they had read uh, our paper with Claudia uh, and we talked about, okay, how to go about um, this. Um, and Anu and her team created an experiential, um, experiential uh, policy arena uh, for cellular agriculture um, food futures. Um, and I'm going to leave it here, and I'm going to leave the stage to Anu for telling you the interesting stuff. Thank you. So, hello, everybody. Nice to be here today, and uh, nice to have a presentation after Idil, because the whole experiential workshop that we had uh, last November was something that came out from discussions between us two. And um, I'll tell you a little bit what this whole project was and is about. It's still continuing. The whole thing is uh, that, that we wanted to do something to study how to change the food system. The, the current system is so un unsustainable that there, there are many things that need to be done and we wanted to do something. And uh, since VTT is a center for technology research, we have a, a pretty big team working with food technology and cellular agriculture is one technology that, that we have a lot of knowledge and experience of. I'm not an expert of cellular agriculture, but I'm, I've been interested in it. And, and since my team focuses very much on involving people in different roles in discussing the possible futures, we started collaborating together with the, with the food scientists. So what we came up with was a vision of a future food court. We thought that when we're, when we're discussing about changing the food system, the whole topic is so large that it's, it's really difficult to grasp any... Uh, 
smaller details into the discussion. So we thought that we have to downscale it to, to a level that is understandable for anybody. And we thought that a shopping mall context and a food court inside a shopping mall might be small enough so that then we can also look, look into real uh, flows of, of food and, and uh, even calculate numbers that, that if we have a shopping mall where we want to have a circular food system, how much of different side streams would we need so that we could have a real cell factory inside a shopping mall functioning and producing ingredients? So that was the technology experts that were thinking about that. And they actually went to uh, the shopping mall in the Arplock shopping mall in, in Alta University campus and were getting stuff from the supermarket that that they would otherwise put into waste like orange peels or bread that is too old to be sold and and we also got some brewer spent spent grain from a, a brewery here in Helsinki and we created we started thinking of a vision where where a lot of the food materials or even not even a material that can be eaten as such can come from a, a shopping mall. If we have vertical farming and rooftop gardens and and uh, and uh, different ways of producing food nearby, there's a lot of green stuff that cannot be eaten, but they can be used in the cell factory as a uh, food for the microbes so that the microbes will then produce food for us. And we also thought that since they need a source of nitrogen, the microbes need that, that we prepared urine in the lab as a nitrogen source. We thought that that might be something that could be possible in the future, that we're not with materials, like, because there's already oh, my internet connection is, but it's functioning, yeah. So different ways of, of creating this circular system inside a, a shopping mall. And then we thought that that local food production in, in an urban context like that would be something that we're trying to reach. And that's something that we want to discuss with people, that how would they see a future like this? And we wanted to involve people in different positions. So consumers, people in, in the food business, retailers, politicians, to have this uh, joint conversation that is this something that we want to achieve? Is this a future that, that we see as a, as a desirable one? But then we thought that, that food will, would still be uh, something that people would gather around, that there's still a social element that, that we want to keep. And then we thought that it's too much to start thinking about business models. So we just thought that, okay, the food court functions in the same way as it does today, that people go there and they pay for the food and and that's it. So that was our vision. But then when we started discussing about it with different experts, uh, they started posing us questions that, that what is it that we will be eating then? What What will the food be like? And we thought that if the experts can't imagine what the food will be like, then how could anybody else imagine that? And that's when I went to Idil that we should do something. We have to create uh, a, an, an experience where people would go to this future restaurant and eat future food. And, and, and uh, then it might be possible to have them discuss together as well. And that's what we did. We uh, went to Camp Gallery in November. There's a, if you've been there, there's a museum downstairs and a restaurant, and there's a lobby area there. So when people uh, who we had invited to have a dinner with us in, in the restaurant in, in Camp Gallery, when they entered the shopping mall, and uh, there's an escalator taking them down to this museum area. There was a butler waiting for them saying that once they take the, the escalator down, 
they are entering year 2040. And then in the lobby area, we had these images of what the camp gallery looks like in 2040, how there are some rooftop gardens there and how there's a cell factory in the in the basement area and, and what, what happens in the shopping mall in 2040. And what kind of business there is also around the shopping mall that, that doesn't exist quite yet. Uh, here's another example of, of the business part. But then we also had dinner. So, so we sat in, in the restaurant and the butler was telling uh, with every uh, meal that or every dish that we had, he was explaining what we're eating, how it's been produced. And then we had a question after the presentation that we should discuss then within our tables. So we had planned that there were four dishes and with, with every dish, there was a different question that, that we would discuss so that we were gathering data from, from the discussions uh, within while we, while we were eating. And I have an example here of a dish, how it was presented. It was an avocado mousse. And uh, we were also including these imaginary companies that were producing the food for, for us in, in the presentation. And uh, there was an explanation of how the food was produced. So that, for example, for the avocado mousse, you would only need a part of an avocado plant. I, I don't show the whole film. Oh go to the next one, so that you don't even need the, the whole leaf. You, it's enough to have a piece of a living leaf to start growing uh, cells on it. And this is what it looks like then when you have the avocado cells. So within with every dish, there was a story of how the food was produced, what the ingredient looks like, and then we had we were eating the food. And even though we told in the beginning that everything that we eat in the restaurant is something that you can buy from the supermarkets today, people forgot that immediately. So they 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 really got emerged into the story. And for example, when we were eating the avocado mousse, there were people <laughs> saying that that this tastes like real avocado. And then I was trying to hold myself not saying that it is real avocado. <laughs> and the same thing with the coffee, because VTT has had a really big press release thing when, when they were growing uh, coffee cells in the lab and they roasted them. And then even they in the lab, the, the scientist tested what the what the lab uh, what the cell coffee tastes like. And they also tested that it actually included caffeine also, so that you can create cell coffee also. But when we were having it in the restaurant, that was also something that people were saying that, that they have been waiting for so long that they could finally taste this. But it wasn't cell coffee. Here's one example of, of a LinkedIn posting from the event that, that we had the menu and, and there were all these this information of companies, imaginary companies there as well. Some companies are actually actually real because there are spin-off companies from VTT who, who are uh, doing business with the with the technology. And then a couple of examples of the of the food here. But this was an example that that I wanted to give in this context. We're still working with with the with the project and we actually had another uh, experience just last week with the city of Espo where we didn't have as many uh, things as as much stuff included in the in the workshop we mainly worked with with still images ai images of what the Kiviroki area in in Espo would look like in 2040 there's a lot of plans for that the city has for the area, and and we included our food production vision into that, and then discussed with the city people, and we had some consumers, and and we had some uh, um, 
educational people there as well from Omnia and, and the Metropolia joining the discussion also. But it works well. It it does make people, it, it does uh, open some locks that we tend to have when we start thinking about the future, that, that we have these ideas that we live with now, and then it's really difficult to start thinking that that this is how we would go to the future. But when we just jump into the future and, and, and start the discussion, it seems to be easier for people to, to get rid of these locks that they have. Even uh, another example from the, the dinner, I one of the dinners, we actually had five of them. I was sitting in the same table with uh, people from a, a meat company. And they said that after the dinner, they said that that they were really sort of thinking that that what can this be that that and they were sort of expecting that we would say that that we don't eat any meat in the future and and we are all vegans and and they were expecting that we would have this very black and white uh, vision of how how we're entering the future but then with this uh eating experience and we actually had some meat included both uh, pork and crickets in the dishes it's it made them think differently also that that maybe there is a different kind of future maybe they should think of things differently also and and i was really happy to get this this uh comment especially from them so that that it changed the way that they had been thinking also Thank you very much. That was great. So now it's the, the opportunity to ask questions. Um, I have the microphone so that uh, we can ask on the mic so we can hear, or the online people can hear the questions. So who would like to start? What's the first then question? <laughs> but that one is on. I can run. I am. Um, thanks. Um, the question is to Anna. I actually like the chance to be in the restaurant on the other side. I was not one of your leaders. I was one of the few people years. It's nice <laughs> now to have yeah. the uh, mysteries. <laughs> I wanted to ask that my colleague during the dinner was um, I think your mic is on, right? Yeah. So probably the, the, yeah, yes, yeah. so it should be fine for the online audience. Yeah. We actually collected two kinds of data so that we have we had a questionnaire before the dinner and then after the dinner, asking the same questions of how people think about the future. So there's the, the, that was one thing that did our dinner affect their ability or capability to think about the future. And then the other thing was that, that we had these questions that we had during the, during the dinner that we wanted people to discuss. And it's actually the, we have so much data that we're still working with it. We have coded it and, and we, we have analyzed and the, the sort of uh, general view that I have from the dinners is that that the comments were very positive and also the feedback that we got from the, the questionnaire it was also that it was very positive but I have a feeling also that that even though we had a list of around 200 people who got the invitation about 80 people came we didn't have room for, for more than that so so but the the dinner we we had full full house for five days, but I had a feeling that the people who were most interested in joining were really sort of uh, had this positive mindset to start with, so that there were very few critical voices that we heard during the dinner, even though we had planted some seeds there where we thought that this is where some people might be provoked. They weren't. So so the the discussion 
the flow was really nice. People were in, in a really good mood and, and uh, enjoying the discussion. But I feel that, that even if we had some uh, different kinds of people, because we had people from, from very different backgrounds, but we, if we had some different kinds of people, there might have been some criticism. We didn't hear it. That way. Yeah. Uh, maybe. Yes. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you. It was super interesting to hear you um, talking about this. I might have like my question is do you study participatory methods to build up future regions? And I was wondering if you mentioned like the pricing and everything. And like uh, people from different backgrounds, and I would, I would like to understand if, like, the people from different backgrounds and kind of, um, they were part of the receiving end of this experience, or that, um, like, participatory process to build up those visions. Like, um, just uh, curious to understand uh, that. Can you hold the microphone? Consistently, yeah, close to you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, that makes a lot of difference. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I was just wondering uh, about, like, the if this experiential future experience, like, uh, it utilizes participatory approaches to build up the vision or is uh, an experience that you have from the receiver end because you just mentioned that probably if you had like different audiences there probably the visions and the comments around that will be very different and also like when building up the vision that could come up with different takes so just wondering that because i'm super curious uh uh, and we uh, and I study a lot of uh, participatory methods to build up uh, future scenarios, including like uh, speculative and decolonial futures thinking. So, just wondering that. Thank you. Yeah, in in our case, the vision building part wasn't so participatory. We did it as a group, but we were all from VTT. So that we have this uh, this technology there as kind of a given thing that that it that was something that that we thought that we would like to study, but I'm I'm sure it maybe you. Could. Um, I mean, I think uh, from a kind of my research question point of view, would experiential futures help? in transition arenas for any future to be kind of discussed from multiple um, perspectives. I think that's a whole research program that, you know, that needs to be continued so, because we, we don't necessarily get to the answer on by, you know, running a, uh, this many workshops with X many different mm -hmm. types of people, we don't necessarily have a full understanding of under what circumstances we can uh, actually kind of trigger critical conversations because we would want them to be there. Um, so I don't think that it's, you know, I, I don't think that it, there's there's a formula of that at the moment. So the whole idea there is to really start to test how, you know, how these conversations can be triggered. And there are so many parameters there from the images that you use, from the food that, you know, you put in front of people. I mean, it was a fine dining experience to start mm -hmm. with. How can you not be happy, <laughs> happy with that, right? So, um, but, but, you know, again, uh, I think it, it's a question of what kind of triggers, what kind of prompts actually create 
uh, and also, of course, combination of backgrounds, etc., actually create a, a richer discussion about the potential of, you know, of technologies, mm -hmm. this technology or X technology. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's yeah, it's a whole research program. Yeah. Um, no, it's just because it's so interesting, like the fact of like this, having this experience of uh, embodying the, the future vision. And we were trying to do like the other way around, working with different communities, like doing kind of role play and embodiment of like uh, certain uh, things to collective build like the future. So I was wondering if like there is a kind of cross cutting, like when with thing like building to use that to build up the vision. Then, yes, thank you. That's a different project. Okay, we have the next question from online. Um, so it's from uh, Osburg, an assistant professor from Tampere University, um, and uh, who is working on designing on gameful experiences of post-human futures and finds this work really fascinating. Um, so the, the question is, I'm sure that the participants were fascinated and excited, and as you have mentioned, expressed the transformativeness of this experience. My question is that apart from these uh, those kinds of expressions, did you realize or can pinpoint transformation also in ways they think after they went through this experience? And there are two more questions. Uh, did you find points that would support the idea of exposing stakeholders to experiential futures can meaningfully change their understanding and enga enga engagements with the future? We have collected data regarding that, but, but it's, and it will be turned into an article, but it's, not, it's still in the process. But we do have a data that, that supports that, that there, there were some changes in, in the way that people uh, thought about future before and after. But it's still in process, so, so I, I can't really tell any details about that but it's it was uh, received as a as a transformative experience in terms of um improving pe people's anticipatory capacities you were referring to uh, um samna oh, and yeah yes yeah yeah work before yeah we had a question from the floor I'm I'm interested about uh, what if you said neuroscientist research says not everybody can imagine or wow N not everybody can imagine really different futures. So my question is, when we are putting all the effort to co-creation in this collective imagination space, are we losing time? We just collect people who have that capability and... Yeah, but I mean, that's the thing, because in Transitions Transformations work, that has been done. That's the, you know, front runner argument that we need to bring together these people who are both experts and can imagine. But that creates um, a risk. Well, first of all, is it ethical that... that what, what? Certain group of people. You're saying that certain group of people are in charge. Yes, would you like to complete my sentence? <laughs> um, I understood that you were saying that uh, basically it's not ethical that one group of people should be. Uh, yeah, that would be one of the questions that I would have and yeah. one of the reasons why I thought experiential futures could help with uh, assisting people to imagine um, alternative futures or at least engage with alternative futures and have a say in them. Um, I mean, are we losing time? Yeah, we're probably losing time uh, if 
we look at it from one perspective. Uh, but I don't think that we, you know, I don't think that transition work should crush majority of the kind of population and impose top down certain ideas about futures that are only created within a kind of, you know, a group of policymakers and experts and what they understand about how futures should be. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I do think that we really need to find ways of democratizing uh, this futures making. And the question is whether experiential futures can help with that. And some people argue that, you know, no, we should not uh, open doors for this kind of futuring because people cannot imagine, but then maybe people can actually be assisted to you know, take part. We have the first comments here and then over there. No, it was just related to this. So, oh, oh, do you have any questions? So, just maybe a quick comment to this that maybe since you had the food experiment in camp gallery which is maybe the finest most exclusive place in finland uh and fine dining which is not accessible to all kinds of groups of people so maybe another uh experiment could be to take this experience to a more casual usual places where different kinds of people gather and, and try and get them to experience it uh, in a more like maybe daily setting. So maybe that could make it even more diverse and inclusive. There we actually had uh, also pictures how people might have these small cell factories or, or machines, cell machines at home. So, so what the kitchen might look like in the future. Ooh. My my comment was uh, going to be related or similar to what uh, the question is asking. And is there, do you think that the general public, because this was an exclusive group, it was probably the early adopters, do you think now would be a good time for to make this a more public experience? Or how do you know when it's the right time to take it from the early adopters to the public uh, as an experience? That's a very good question, and and uh, the follow up question would be that who will pay for that? Yes. <laughs> that that's, that's the problem with with uh, with us all the time. That we are working with projects, and then the project ends, and then we should have follow up project. And this topic, especially this uh, systemic change, is a very difficult topic to get funded. So it's it's also it's not just that that we have. Uh, decision makers or or we have uh, consumers who have trouble understanding what the future might be. It's also that our funding system is is functioning so that that it doesn't take into account the systemic change that takes a long time. It says that we have to have a project ready in one and a half years. So, and and also we recently uh, applied for business funding. Yes, we funding did. and we got rejected. Yes. What was the um, what was the justification? It was like uh, too specific, or yes, it wasn't large enough. The topic wasn't quite broad enough. Yeah, or broad enough. Anyway, um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a very good question, yes. and and in an in an i in my ideal world, it would be so that you know the next phase of this would exactly be like okay, um, alternative futures, alternative futures where the society is organized differently, right? Because this particular one was very um, business centric as well. All of these, you know, kind of products were being produced by some businesses, but then, um, you know, in another kind of scenario, this could be also the technology itself could be democratized. And so also working with different ways of kind of diffusing and installing cellular agriculture in society, and also working with really um, um, like in different neighborhoods of Helsinki with very different people, etc. But in the end, all comes out to research money. Um, and I mean, I'm so excited about uh, continuing this work, 
Um, but yeah, if you want to pay for it, then there's definitely nothing to do. Sadly. I unfortunately missed most of the presentation. I came late, but I, it's an interesting kind of relation why I came too late, because at my workplace, we had a collaboration workshop where it was all about change. In a way, I think what you are talking about is change in, in a large scale. And one of the discussion was really about um, impact to the end user of changes when it comes to ICT. And in a way, I... Right, it was very much what you said about demo, uh, democratization, right, and getting people involved. Because, right, if you don't involve them and you don't ask them, right, that will just pretty much go, you know, over that. And the other one, now my my brain is faster than my tongue as usual, but um, I also wanted to comment on what you said. Yeah, um, I mean, I recently met a friend who started nine months ago in VTT, and I think he's exactly working on, you know, that it's not just about, you know, there's whatever, four-year, you know, EU funding project, right? And papers are written, and then it's the next one. But really doing the involvement between VTT and companies and organizations so that there's a lot of kind of impact coming beyond that. So, sorry that I came too late, but it was an important reason, and thanks for doing this work. It's, I mean, it's really, really difficult to find uh, funding from any instrument that actually deals with governance of long-term systemic change, because everybody, uh, or, or the funding, you know, um, funding instrument mindset is still uh, what is going to be the immediate outcome of this work for business Finland? It's you know new business export revenue for EU something else, uh, but this is incredibly needed work right now because we are in the process of dismantling existing systems, and unless we really find ways to properly think about what we are replacing. Uh, or you know, it, my, my, my sick brain, um, what, what systems are going to replace these, you know, systems that are being dismantled? It's just going to be an incredibly, terribly uh, maladaptive way of dealing with change. Um, but that's the reality. Um, I mean, you know, e EU is giving... EU used to be a great resource for really experimental research. Now it's all about um, all about you know uh, innovation that actually can create IP tomorrow kind of thing. And I find that to be very problematic and very very concerning as a sustainable change uh, scholar. Mm. Question here. Thank you, and thank you for this very inspiring talk. Um, I didn't use it. Sorry, can you hold the yeah. closer? Ooh, okay. So thanks uh, again for for this very inspirational discussion and presentations. Um, I don't. You said in the beginning that uh, this experimental uh, futures are strongly connected to forecasting. So rather, what is um, a foresight? Sorry, foresight. So. What's probable, and we, we need some technical expertise oftentimes to kind of envision what might happen in the future. Um, how would you, in practice, if not VTT is now reaching out with a concrete case, how can we leverage these experts in adding their foresight of what's probable or possible in the future? I would say that foresight is not about probability, uh, hopefully not, um, but more about kind of exploring what might come out from certain signals that we can read, uh, adding a lot of creativity to it. So at least that's the foresight that I am working with. Um, but I am not sure if I understood the question about the experts. Were you referring to 
foresight experts or people who make scenarios or which experts are we? Yeah. And while I was asking the question, I realized that I mixed up two terms and you're correct. It's about what's possible. But yet we need experts to tell, like, well, not to tell, but to share their insights of what's the newest technology, what's out there, what are the signals we have. It's, it's quite useful to, or valuable to have these people on, on board in these projects to add a certain expertise um, to the common crowd. Yeah, but this is not about uh, excluding experts from the process. This is actually opening up the processes so that it's not only experts talking to experts, uh, essentially. So in my uh, understanding, a process uh, or, I mean, first of all, let's call it a transition arena, would of course involve experts, not to tell us which technologies are coming, but to... Um, to provide expert insights into a discussion that actually is broader than technologies, hopefully. Um, so this is not about putting experts aside or outside of the process, but opening the process so that um, you know, the broader stakeholder base can be part of those conversations. And I also think that expertise needs to be challenged as well because expertise can be incredibly blind you know when you're an expert uh, you know a lot about something but you know very little about everything else so your understanding of what might happen you know into the future might be very limited actually so you know, I think uh, we also should think about what is the role of expertise in these processes, um, rather than assuming that experts know the best for all, because I am an expert on certain things, but I don't know what's best for everyone. Um, so, yeah. Um, we have a, a continuation question. But I, I would... Yeah. Thank you, but I wonder if Anu uh, also has a response to this or no. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I actually did, but I only focused on this. Yes. But what I started thinking while, while you were talking, I was thinking that, that a, a lot of times, especially when, when working with engineers, um, we tend to think that, that this technology is good for this and this purpose. And that's also one thing that, that why it is so important to, to have these, these discussions so that we can not only uh, be experts of, of technology and tell what is possible, but also hear and listen carefully what the feedback is. Because sometimes... Uh, Maybe not so much with the cellular agriculture, but with some other technologies, there might be an idea what this technology is good for. And then when it is discussed with a group of other people, you realize that, okay, it can be used for that. It should be used for something completely different. And that, that has happened, that, that technology has been developed for one purpose, but then people start using it for a completely different purpose. So I think that that the uh, the uh, the conversation both ways is really important when, when looking into how technology is used. That maybe didn't answer your question, but that's what I started thinking when you yeah. when you talked. Yeah. Sorry, I talked too much, so you forgot <laughs> your response. Okay. The next question comes from online. So the the question is, who's future, and how are kids involved? Is this like, uh, is this a very general question thrown at the, you know, space or is this specifically about the project? In your research, the answer is <laughs> appearing here. Thank you. In my research, small kids know. We, uh, ethical reasons, we've been working with, mainly with kids that are, well, not all of them have been 18 years of old, but close to 18 anyway, so that they, we've been working together with high schools so that they can work with us without us having to ask permission from their parents every time that we we collaborate. But we have been working with high schools, yes. Mm -hmm. 
and I would say our future. I, I wouldn't restrict to to any all of us. I think we're talking about all of us when we're talking about the planet. And in my research, uh, that's, for example, not about this project, but uh, in another project where we look at um, how we can how we can mediate needs of humans uh, and wildlife. We worked with uh, younger kids um, uh, and we looked at what they can bring in, uh, in relating to nature in ways that we as adults cannot or have forgotten, for example. So we bring in the voices um, to research. So uh, I really enjoyed the presentation, and there were a lot of new perspectives that were introduced. Uh, perhaps not a question, but I did have some uh, uh, that the discussion about the top-down approaches was very intriguing because uh, experts are generally so excited about bringing change and fully immersed in the research and then exactly what will happen and prospective uh, futures and they're just so ready to do it. But like the question would arise, just how sustainable would a future solely imagined by experts be? Because a, the, the most that they can do is create a policy, but it's the people that make it a reality. And if the people are not on board, then the uh, sorry. Then uh, if the people aren't really on board, then it's not really going to last very right long. Uh, and this was some, some. It just reminded me of something that uh, I came across in my thesis research a few years ago, uh, where there was this decision uh, taken. There, there was this fountain in the, the middle of the street where people really liked to feed the birds, and there were a lot of heritage buildings around the area. The uh, policymakers were uh, concerned about the buildings getting destroyed by so many birds coming around. So the fountain was removed uh, to prevent people from doing that. But now that there was no structure there, but people still went there to feed the birds. <laughs> right. So uh, it really uh, give it's really food for thought, and uh, where ex experts and the people should really come together at the middle ground. To come uh, so that we actually attain uh, a future that is sustainable in that sense. Thank you. Great point. Online audience. Online audience. Oh, no. or the audience. Can you use the microphone close to your Hello. Yes, please. Wait, this is good? Okay. Uh, so um, I was just thinking of uh, um, yeah. I was thinking of like what's the extent of this uh, cell agriculture in the futures? Like you know, um, could I have like a fruit that is seasonal in India, like in Finland? Is that the extent? And what happens if I have access to that fruit throughout the season? Uh, I mean, are there going to be limitations that consider, like, the rhythm of, like, in a way, when the food becomes... Yeah, I would say it, it's more like uh, there are products that are suffering more from the climate change, and then it might not be wise to coffee, for example. So it might be, not be possible and wise to use so much land for trying to farm coffee that it might actually be worse if we try to, to cultivate it in the traditional way and it might be better that we also in addition to to coffee real coffee bushes we also prepare coffee in, in cell factories. I think that would be the, the smarter way of using the technology instead of using it for something that that where there's no problem, for example, uh, growing wheat or barley or oats, I don't think the technology should be used for that. And not for every, all the berries either, but, but when there is a 
suitable side stream that can be used, then why not? Then then you can use it for for some ingredient like that. Okay. Um, then we're going to take one question from the chat. Uh, so um, thank you for brilliant and inspiring presentations. I have a question. How can we scale experiential futures to be available to the wider public? How to create these unique impactful experiences to the masses? I can imagine uh, multiple ways. Again, I am wondering who's gonna Do you have an answer to this? Uh, I think that that there's a need for different kinds of examples so that it can be scaled up. One small thing that we will be doing now, uh, also the, the workshop with the city of Espoo was with people that were invited, even though we had consumers there as well, they were invited to the, to the event. And uh, we'll have the materials uh, visible in the Lippolaiva library soon and possibly also in Entres. So that's, that's a way of making them available for anybody who yes. happens to walk by and notice it there. But I think that there's really a need for different kinds of ways of, of testing how, how they can be scaled. We're running out of time, but I promised uh, uh, one more question, so here we go. It will be fast. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, other than that, uh, what kind of aspects other than that uh, eating experience like texture, display, look, smell, uh, did you consider like cost of installment, cost of uh, like transportation, storing, and some kind of like work needed workload, needed education, uh, like in a more comprehensive way, did you consider all of these right now in our in your foresight, or just right now experience of eating? Thank you. Do I need in in this case, what we mainly did was that that we thought about the circular system, so that that the most of the calculations were based on how that would function. But there are other projects, the cellular agriculture, technology scientists have other projects where they are calculating different things. And there's actually three spin-offs that, that have come out of the lab that are doing things in, in larger scale. So for, uh, for example, uh, Solar Foods is one spin-off from VTT. Uh, they say that they are producing food from thin air. They do feed the microbes also. So it's not only air that, that they live with. And they have started, or they got a permission to start selling, selling their product in Singapore. Not in Europe yet, but, but it's something that is out there in the, in the market as well. So there are, there are several other projects where more, uh, more thorough calculations have been made. Uh, well, I just wasn't sure whether, Chata, you were asking in designing the experience, were there prompts that actually highlighted, you know, not only the eating experience uh, of products produced by cellular agriculture, but everything else that relates to cellular agriculture, was that your question? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe not in this instance, but also um, I would like to underline that the first step to, is to understand whether experiential futures can actually help with assisting people to be able to imagine these, you know, alternative futures. Um, and then the next step after that would be how to create uh experiences so that anything, it can be cellular agriculture, but any other 
you know, proposal or vision about uh, futures uh, from a critical perspective, um, if it makes sense, which then, of course, in the case of cellular agriculture, would also include prompts that would give an idea on how much energy is used in, you know, producing these things, etc. But in this particular project, there was not, it was a very small scale project. And I'm really impressed what the VTT was able to produce within such a short period of time and with very little budget. Um, and I am also very, very uh, excited to um, learn about uh, the outcome of the, yeah, the data, so, but. Before they kick us out, we should uh, leave the premises. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a really lovely evening. And if any of you want to join, some of us are going to the cocktail bar outside the main door, which is just across the street there. So uh, we'll have to see you there. But thank you for coming. Right. Right. Yes.